one page here. That's all. And uh, hopefully the Lord will bless his word. But I want us to look at one of the most blunt and to the point scriptures in the word of God. And all of them are straight. The word of God don't beat around the bush and it don't contradict itself. But as I read this back to it, the first of the week, the Lord laid it on my heart and been studying it throughout the week. And I pretty much just one little verse, one little scripture really stuck out. But I thought how blunt and to the point that it is. If we take to heart what the writer is saying. It's 1 Peter 5 and 8. Many of you know it, can probably quote it before you turn there. 1 Peter 5 and 8. It simply says, be sober. Yes. <laughs> Peter don't beat around the bush, does he? No. He says, be sober. Be vigilant. Because... Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This book of First Peter is written to the elect ones of God. <laughs> it's not written to the sinner, <laughs> right? It's written to the elect in God. The church of God, the saints of God who have experienced salvation and who has the Lord ruling and reigning in their life, in their heart. Peter says, be sober. There is no time in our lives to be drunken or intoxicated on the things of this life Amen. or this world. There is no time to have our judgment impaired or our discernment distorted or our vision blurred. He says bluntly, be sober. <laughs> Hopefully by the time we leave here tonight, every one of us will know what First Peter 5 and 8 says. Be sober. Yes, help us, Jesus. Hmm. We must understand there is a difference in being sober and being intoxicated. How many know that? I've never been drunk on alcohol and I don't know what it's like. But I know one thing. Peter says we must know there is a difference. Yes. There is a little device that they have this day and age that we're living in. There are goggles that you can put on that identifies to you your judgment when one is intoxicated. How many has ever had the privilege of putting those on, looking through them? I have. <laughs> but listen, when you put them on, everything around you changes. Your vision changes, your balance changes, your judgment changes. I don't know how they've done it. You put them on and you think, oh yeah, I can see that door. And you're reaching for the handle and it's 35 feet out yonder, you know. And you take a step, you see this step right here, but you're way back here and, and, you, and you're doing like this. Why? It mimics a drunk. They use these in driving classes. <laughs> oh. Telling on myself now. I've never had a DUI. Don't take, don't go, don't get me wrong. But if you get a speeding ticket, you might have to go to driving class and they might make you wear them. What is it for? It's designed 
to try to get people's attention and to tell them this is how you are when you're drunk. You're not in control as you think you are. You stand there and they toss you a ball and you're just like trying to catch the ball. Peter said, be sober. Mm, God help us. There's no time for our vision to be blurred, for our judgment to be distorted in any kind of way. Hmm. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Listen, we better get our thoughts right. We better get our discernment right. We better get our judgments right. There's no time. How many believes we're living in the end time? There's no time to be drunken or intoxicated on anything the devil would bring into your life. You don't have to turn up a bottle of liquor to get drunk. You can be drunk spiritually and not know it. Mm. The Word of God here is speaking about self-control. We must live in reality. Look in Titus 2 and 11. The Word of God says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us... Now wait a minute. Are you thankful for the grace of God? That Listen, for for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Can you say thank you, Jesus, for the grace of God? But listen, what else the grace of God does? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace of God will teach you things if you will allow it to teach you. One of the first things it will teach you is you need to be sober. Hmm. Fully alert of everything that's around you. I've seen guys who were intoxicated. They didn't even know what their name was. They couldn't tell you who they were, where they lived, where they was going, where they just came from. They was just, breathing was all. You know, Satan would like to have you in that shape spiritually. Yes, he would. But we are nearing the end time. We are in the end time. 1 Peter 4 and 7 It says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Do do we really believe we're living in the end time? in In the last hour, the 11th hour? Peter says here again, therefore be sober. We need the help of the Lord and His Spirit. That Satan wouldn't blindside us. But Peter says, be sober. Be vigilant. What's this mean? You need, there needs to be strict attention. It's critical that you be sober. Because your adversary, the devil, wait a minute. Everybody say, my adversary. my adversary. Peter says, your adversary. He is your arch 
enemy. How many likes having enemies? How many likes making people mad, they being mad at you, you being mad at them, and, you know, there's just... Nobody enjoys that. And we may, that, you know, we, we may, you know, somebody like Brother Nick here, he has no enemies. <laughs> somebody don't love Brother Nick, something wrong up here, right? But let me tell you an enemy that Brother Nick has. He's the devil. You got one, Nick. Every one of us has got an enemy. We may get along with everybody and everything's hunky-dory, but let me tell you something. Peter says, because your adversary, you have an arch enemy of your soul. Now listen, he's the enemy of all mankind. He's not just Brother Nick's enemy. He's your enemy. He's my enemy. He is the enemy of your parents, your children, your neighbor, the one on the pew beside of you. But, you know, a lot of times we can detect the devil playing havoc in everybody else's life. Do you know that? It's easy to stand back and say, well, the, de the devil's got control of them. The devil's working this in their life. But let me tell you something. We better be sober. You know, not only do I need to be able to discern the devil working in your life, I better be able to discern him working in my life. Amen. Amen. Yeah, he's your enemy. He wants to carry you to hell. But he's my enemy also. Yes. Hmm? Yes, he Peter said, your adversary, the devil. The arch enemy of your soul is not your brother. Right? Right? It's not your brother, it's not your sister, it's not your pastor or your overseer or somebody across the seas, <laughs> right? They're not your enemy. You know who the enemy is? Your adversary? Peter said he's the devil. We better be sober and we better be realizing it. We have an adversary of our soul. But the devil himself... Satan. Everybody say Satan. Satan. Lucifer. Old Slewfoot. Right? Many, many other names. Prince of darkness. The accuser of the brethren. But Satan. Peter called him the devil. Mm. Why is he your enemy? What have I ever done to the devil? Well, maybe you've never done anything to him. But let me tell you why he's your enemy. He was forever cast out of heaven one day. You know who knows how beautiful the splendor of heaven is? Satan. But he was cast out of heaven one day. Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Hmm. He's upset about it. He knows there will never be a chance in eternity that he could ever go back to the status in heaven that he once was. And he is envious, jealous, and has hatred built up in his heart against you. Listen. The 70 came back to the Lord one day rejoicing and said, Even the devils are subject to us. The Lord said, Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Now, this book here was written to the elect of God. You have an adversary of your soul. Why is that? Because your name is written down in heaven. That makes you and the devil enemies. He wants to do everything in his power to keep you from making it to heaven. Mm. This is the one thing 
that Jesus said we should rejoice over. Over everything else in our life, it, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice because your name is written down in heaven. Amen. 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 Can we say glory to God? Glory, glory to God. Amen. Hmm? He says the devil as a roaring lion. And let me tell you something. Peter expresses the extreme caution here to identify your adversary. To identify, he expresses the extreme caution for soberness in your life to recognize the danger of your enemy. He's not just a little harmless kitty cat, but Peter here uses the extreme description that he can possibly come up with. He said he is a roaring lion. Hmm. And he walketh about going everywhere seeking whom he may devour. Proverbs 30 and 30. Listen to what it says about a lion. A lion which is strongest among the beast and turneth not away for any. In other words, what he's saying is he ain't afraid of nothing. He's the king of the jungle. He has a ferocious roar. All the beasts of the, of the jungle, when they hear that lion roar, the hair stands up on their neck. Why? He's the king. He's the most deadliest. He's the most vicious that there is. And Peter used that analogy for Satan, the enemy of your soul. He is a roaring lion. No doubt Peter remembered the Lord warning him of Satan. No doubt Peter never forgot that time that the Lord Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, Satan desire to have you and to sift you as wheat. You know what Peter done? He didn't take that to heart. He didn't, he didn't take it as serious as he should have. And he failed God. He failed victim to that old devil, his adversary. But here, listen to his words. Be sober! No doubt he, that was in his mind as he was writing this. I've got to get the point across to them. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. What else could Peter say to try to get our attention today? What else could he say? Listen, he says, he's seeking whom he may devour. A lion stalks his prey. Do you know that? He don't just madly, you know make a mad dash out in the middle of the jungle somewhere hoping he's going to find... No, he, he walks about and he seeks out his prey and he begins to stalk the prey. I watched some videos of the lion. They're ferocious beasts. But I want to, for us to see something here. What prey does the lion seek out? He seeks out the weakest, the easiest, those away from the herd, those that's going to put up the least amount of resistance. As strong and ferocious as he is, he's conniving and he's subtle and he stalks his prey. I saw a video of the lion, these warthogs out there, they was just grazing and having a good old time. And the whole time this lion was at a distance and he was stalking them. And he moves like this right here. And 
and he moves real slowly and he'll raise his head up above the weeds in the fields. And if they look his way, he'll ease back down. And while they're on their guard looking, you know, wondering what's going on, he just lays silently. And when they turn their head, he'll do like this. It's just like a little kitten playing with a toy. Except it's a ferocious lion. And they got the cameras so close on these beasts, it was amazing as they, as they stalked that, their prey, and as they eased up and inched up, when they got close enough, this lion, you would think, any minute, I mean, why don't he just get him? He wants to make sure he gets him. He don't want to take no unnecessary careless chances. But as he got close to him, he even turned his paws over that he wouldn't make noise on the ground where his fur would rub the ground. Ain't that pretty amazing? Peter used this as an analogy of the enemy of your soul. He said he's a roaring lion. They wait until they are within 30 yards. They don't make a mad dash, just wild they aim and hope. No, they seek out, they stalk out the prey, and they get close enough that when they pounce, they know it's over. Ferocious animals. Peter said, your adversary, the devil, the one that's after your soul, he's not just making a careless huh, aim at you, but he's stalking you and he's seeking you out and he's going to wait to your weakest moment and that's when he's going to pounce on you and devour you. He's not just playing He's going to devour you. God help us. We are responsible not to give the devil any place in our lives. Is that what the word says? Neither give place to the devil. But look with me in Luke chapter 11 verse 21. The Bible says, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man... He walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. Uh-oh. You better be on your guard against the enemy of your soul. When Jesus delivers us and saves us and we're made clean, the devil just gives up all hope of you ever being lost again. No. No. That's when you're a greater challenge to him than you've ever been. And his desire is to re-enter back into you. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Don't give the devil a foothold in your life. Don't, don't give place to the devil. He's not playing games with you. He wants to devour your soul. He wants your name erased from the Lamb's book of life. That is his ultimate goal for you. He wants to devour your soul in hell. Satan knows that his days are numbered and one day he's going to be bound for a thousand years and at the end of those thousand years he's going to come out only for judgment. And then he's going to be cast in to the lake of fire forever and ever. 
And He wants to take you with Him. Be sober. Be vigilant. Recognize who the devil is and who the devil ain't. Right? The devil works in subtle ways. God help us. We have a responsibility given us by the Word of God to resist the devil. To fight against the devil. There's not a single one of those little animals that that lion pounces on that they do not fight. Every one of them fights. Let me tell you something. We better put up the fight. We better be sober and vigilant and resist the devil. Ephesians 6 and 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Listen, those videos that I watched, when the prey sensed that the lion was around and they would raise their head and look, the lion would... We better be standing. It's when we are careless and drunken and intoxicated on everything that there is around us, that's when we are the most vulnerable to the enemy of our soul. But stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the whole armor of God. We need spiritual help and strength that we would be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. His tactics, his schemes, his little games that he plays. They're designed to devour your soul. The Bible tells us in James, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. There needs to be some resisting. We are too easy to allow Satan just to have his way in our life. God help us. We need to be doing some resisting. Submitting ourselves to God Almighty and resisting the devil. During the war, World War II, there was a lot of battles that happened on the seas. If Brother Bernays was here tonight, he could tell us some. But the Germans had a battleship called the Bismarck. It was a ruthless, ruthless battleship. Britain was in the war, and the only way for them to stay in the war and help fight against the enemy of the world, they was dependent upon ships bringing supplies to them that they might be able to stay in the war. These ships, cargo ships, carried supplies, oil. Some of them was medical ships. They weren't blasting cannons, but they were just carrying supplies. Let me tell you, the Bismarck, it stayed on float of the Atlantic out there, and it stayed on patrol, and anything that came within its sight, it destroyed it was shutting down the nation of the great British nation. It was a roaring lion on the seas. Winston Churchill saw the only way they were going to survive, the whole world depended on this, to sink the Bismarck. Peter says, be sober. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil. Winston Churchill sent out a message to every British battleship that existed. The code simply read, sink the Bismarck. Make this number one priority. Sink the Bismarck at any cost. Sink him. 
every British ship there was began to watch and focus on finding that ship. Well, you know what? They found it. And the battles began. And I believe it was the Hood and I can't remember the other ships that attacked the Bismarck. And it was limping and had been torn apart, but it was still afloat. And I can't remember for the life of me the name of the little uh, port that it pulled into. It was a, a neutral port. It was not in the war. I can't remember if it was in France. But it pulled into this port. And the captain of that ship was looking for a few days to stay right here and work on this ship. And get it back in fighting condition. But let me tell you something. The people there at that port said, get out. Mm, there's got to be some resistance somewhere. Mm. They told that captain, get that ship out of our port. We want nothing to do with you. He turned out, he steamed that ship, and he floated back out to open waters. And they sunk it. Let me tell you something. We better do some resisting. We better realize who. Listen, when the Bismarck would go out, they'd stop at different places and they'd paint the ship. Different colors. <laughs> trying to camouflage it, trying to make it look like, oh, this, we're not a battleship. We paint it different colors. But they realized this is the Bismarck. And they said, get it out of our port. Get it out of our port. We need to tell Satan, get out of my life. Get out of my life. I know who you are. I recognize who you are. You're after my soul. We need to tell him that. Peter said, be sober. Be vigilant. Huh? Resist the devil. Let me tell you something. He is going to pounce on you. He's seeking you out right now. He's stalking you right now. He's waiting for the right moment. When you're at your weakest, He'll give you any excuse that you want to hear. And then He'll pounce on you and devour you. Let me tell you something sad, sad, sad. It broke my heart when I heard these dear souls last week. They were part of the great church of God. And tonight they're not. Hmm. Isn't that sad? Let me tell you something. It could be me. Yeah. It could be you. Yeah. The devil has no respect to persons either. Yeah. He wants every one of us. He is your enemy. Yeah. Recognize him. Yeah. I want you to stand with me tonight. I want to open the altar and give us the opportunity to pray.